Good afternoon, committee members, uh, members of the public, and those watching on YouTube. Uh, I'll start this meeting at two o'clock. Um, before we go any further, I'll, I'll be chairing this uh, committee meeting this afternoon as the chairman is away. I've asked uh, Councillor Peacock to be my vice chair. Uh, committee members, is there any objections to that? Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Before we go any further, I would like to uh, a bit of housekeeping rules. And I'll ask the vice chair to read out the fire safety notice. Thank you. The building fire alarm signal is a continuous two-tone alarm. On hearing the evacuation <coughs> alarm, firstly, leave the building by the nearest marked exit route. Secondly, follow the green signs to the assembly point, large staff car park opposite the entrance to the building. Three, anyone who cannot use the stairs will be helped by the officers present after other people have left. Fourthly, do not return to the building until told it is safe to do so by an authorised officer. Also, the whole of the council site is a no smoking area. Filming from the public gallery is permitted, but members must please refrain from filming within the council chamber so as not to distract the meeting. And mobile phones must be switched to silent. Thank you, Vice Chair. <clears throat> as I mentioned, my name is uh, Councillor Sweat, and I'll be chairing this meeting this afternoon. Uh, to my right is Mr. Steve King, the planning application team leader. To his right is uh, Paula Slim, our legal officer for today. Um, to her right is uh, Stuart Malcolm, the senior planning officer. To my left is uh, the vice chair, Councillor Peacock. To his left is Mr. Kevin Toogood, the monitoring officer. And uh, in the corner we have uh, Alison from Member Services, who's very kindly taken the minutes today. And over in my right hand corner, is Lucinda who's doing the technical bits. I move to item one on the agenda, and that is to receive apologies for absence. I have apologies from Councillor Phillips and Councillor Jackson. Item two is to receive declarations of interest from members in respect of any matter on the agenda. Uh, do I have any? I see none. Item three. To agree the minutes of the previous meeting held on 16th March 2023. Um, are, they, are they agreed or do I have any issues with that? Press buttons on that one. Agreed. Sorry? Yeah, is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Item four on the agenda is to consider any items that the chairman agrees to take as urgent business. I have none. So we go to the first item on the agenda, DM22-2832, Wildon House, Lewis Road, Ashurst Wood. And that will be introduced by Steve King. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Chairman. Um, just before I get into the presentation, just one minor um, update on the update sheet. Just correcting a typo in the uh, committee report um, in para 10.5. And since the update sheet was um, prepared, I did receive uh, an email that had been sent uh, from the local ward member, uh, Councillor Belsey. I think that's been copied to all committee members. Yeah, so I won't read it out in full, but um, just to very briefly summarise. It concludes, uh, Councillor Belsey concludes that um, he supports the, the recommendation uh, for approval and um, welcomes uh, the, the proposal. So that's just very much in summary. So just to run through the, the application, um, proposal seeks full planning permission for the uh, demolition of the existing buildings on the site, which comprise the EDF Energy Building and the Wealden um, Life Centre Building, um, and its replacement with 50 dwellings. So this is the application site outlined in red here. It's on the uh, western side of the 
Lewis Road, um, in between East Grinstead, which is further up to the north, and Ashurst Wood, um, which, is, which is further down this way, uh, to the southeast. And uh, as I say, the, the application is a full application for 50 dwellings. Um, around the site, you've got uh, scattered residential units on the opposite side of the road. Along the um, eastern boundary of the site, there's uh, trees and hedging, and then you've got two properties, um, North Lodge and the barn, two residential properties. Um, to the rear of the site, uh, also in the applicant's ownership, which is what's denoted by the, the blue land, blue line, is uh, an area of ancient woodland. The land falls away quite sharply down um, to the southwest. And to the northwest, you've got uh, flats of Carlton House. There's five units there. Ashbourne um, House there, nine, nine flats there. The whole site is uh, in the countryside as designated in the, in the district plan. It's also allocated for uh, development in the Ashurst Wood neighbourhood plan. And the site is also all within the um, high wheeled area of outstanding natural beauty. There's quite a bit of um, planning history on the site that I'll go through um, in the next section of the presentation. But this is just um, an extract to show um, the ancient woodland, which is the uh, dark green cross hatching. And then the lighter green here is the 15 metre uh, buffer zone around that, that ancient woodland. And you can see from the slide that at the moment that that buffer zone um, actually has car parking in it um, associated with the former um, EDF energy office. And just the other thing to point out on this plan is this dwelling here that's um, marked in red, Camden Cottage, is a Grade 2 listed building, so that's the heritage asset that's referred to um, in the committee report. So these are the existing plan again. And this is the proposed um, site plan. So you can see the existing buildings all demolished on the site and replaced with a mixture of uh, flats and houses. And I'll come on to um, that in a little bit more, more detail. Just in terms of the, the history of the site, that's set out in section um, eight of the committee report. And you, you'll see from there that there is um, an extant planning permission that was granted in 2020 for the demolition of just the EDF energy building and its replacement with 54 flats in this, this arrangement, a mixture of three-storey and, and four-storey buildings. So that um, is a scheme that could still be built out and that planning permission runs until uh, November of this year. So in terms of um, what's been approved, previously um, by the planning inspector. These are just illustrative. Uh, <coughs> uh, these are the elevations of that show some of those blocks of flats. So this is a scheme that, that could be built on part of the site. So what's proposed um, now, say demolition of all the existing buildings <coughs> and uh, 50 uh, dwellings on the site. Two blocks of flats, uh, three storeys in height, um, block one there, block two there next to Carlton House, with the remainder uh, 35 uh, units uh, all being uh, dwelling houses. Uh, the, the mix of the uh, scheme is set out in um, paragraph 10.9 in the committee report. Would be a contemporary uh, development in terms of the style, similar to, to what's been approved. The scheme also proposes um, outside the site a uh, pedestrian refuge to um, facilitate pedestrian crossing. So that's just to the northwest of the um, existing access. So that's the proposed pedestrian refuge. Just in terms of um, some elevations, so that's what's proposed uh, block one of the flats. So similar um, style to, to what has been previously approved. They're the uh, floor plans of the block one, ground and first floor. 
Block two, uh, similar elevational treatment in terms of the, the contemporary style. And those are the side elevations of that block, one uh, facing onto uh, Carlton House. That's that elevation in the northwest. Um, so proposed street scenes through the site. So the, the sections uh, in the bottom corner there show um, where, you, where you would see see those from so that that section there is from the what you'd see from the road the middle drawing is this section here so it's, it's that run of houses along the the eastern boundary of the site and the bottom one is what you'd see if you're at the back of the site so that run of houses along the rear just um, some elevations of typical house types within the site so you can see quite a modern contemporary scheme um, that's proposed in terms of the elevational treatment and uh, floor plans of, of those units so two and a half stories <coughs> rooms in the roof served by dormers uh, that's a just a proposed uh, visualization to to show the site um, in in 3d so that's the Lewis Road, A22 at the top of the site, access in the dwellings that um, back onto the Lewis Road, the two blocks of flats, and then the remainder being houses on the site. And just some photos um, of, of the site. So the, these show the existing um, EDF energy building. So they're, they're from, from the rear of, of that building You'll see there's also a large telecoms um, tower there that's been decommissioned now, but that's the, the, the tower itself is still on the site. Uh, views of the rear of the EDF Energy Building um, and the, the garden area to the rear of that property. These are taken uh, from the frontage of the site, so that's, that's the Wealdon House, it's in commercial use. Views to the rear of um, Wealdon House, see that's Ash, Ashburn House in the um, to the rear at, at the side of the site. These are views um, looking at, yeah, towards Wealdon House, that's Carlton House at the, at the front, this is the car parking area at, at the front of the south site, so that's Carlton House to the side and just views along the A22 um, with the access into the site as a uh, there's a right turn lane um, into the site so if I just go back to the site plan and just in terms of um, the issues they're all set out in the in the committee report so I won't run through them all in in great detail but I will flag up um, some of the, the main points to note from the report uh, so the legal framework um, in how uh, the application has to be assessed is set out in section 11 of, of the report. Uh, planning application should be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Um, and when looking at the development plan, um, that has to be read as a whole. So it, it's not a requirement that a planning application has to comply with each and every policy in the development plan to, com to comply with that plan. Uh, for this part of the district, the development plan comprises the, the district plan, the Ashurst Wood Neighbourhood Plan and the, the site allocations uh, development plan document. Uh, the national planning policy framework is an important material planning consideration um, because that is the government's um, advice on how the planning systems should operate. So that should always be given um, uh, significant weight in, in determining uh, planning applications. So the, the, the main issues and the, the assessment are dealt with in page, uh, in section 12 of the report. Uh, the principle that's set out in paragraph 12.2 onwards, but uh, the principle of the development um, is established here by virtue of the fact that the, the site is allocated for development in the neighborhood plan. And also that there is um, a planning permission in place on part of the site already for 54 units so that the principle is, is established here in terms of design matters they're dealt with in paragraph uh, 12.10 onwards 
Um, and it's your officer's view for the reasons set out in the committee report. This is a, a good quality scheme in terms of the, the design. Um, it will have its own distinct character. And um, for the, all the reasons set out in the report, we're, we're content that the design's acceptable. <coughs> Residential amenity, that's dealt with in section 12.4 onwards in the committee report. And um, the report refers to the, the impacts on the two properties that are nearest to the site um, on the east, the, the barn and North Lodge, and uh, on the other, other side, Carlton House and, and Ashbourne House. You'll see that from the report that the test in terms of an impact on neighbour amenities, whether there's significant harm, which is quite a high bar, um, and officers are content that there, there wouldn't be significant harm from this scheme. Um, matters relating to the air outstanding natural beauty and, and the heritage asset, the, the listed building I referred to, are dealt with in paragraphs 12.47 and 12.50 of the report. A uh, key issue on, on this application has been uh, provision of affordable housing and the mix. And that's dealt with in a bit of detail in paragraphs 12.54 onwards in the report. Uh, sites of more than 11 dwellings um, should provide 30% affordable housing um, unless it's demonstrated that it's not viable to do so. Um, in this case, the applicants have put forward a case that it isn't viable to provide affordable housing and, and build out the site. That's been um, independently assessed by consultants appointed by the, the local planning authority and they've concluded that the case has been made by, by the applicants. Um, so that's the reason why there's no affordable housing proposed at, at this stage with the application. Um, but what will happen um, if members resolve to, to approve the scheme is that the legal agreement attached to the, the planning permission would have a, a viability review um, clause in there um, and the, the details of that are set out in the report um, but essentially that allows for a review to be taken um, on the sale or letting of 75% of the units um, so essentially if market conditions change and more income is generated from the scheme, it allows an opportunity for um, contributions to affordable housing to, uh, to come forward, but we wouldn't know that until, until the future. Um, transport matters are dealt with in paragraphs 12.64 onwards. As you've seen from the presentation, the site will use the existing access. Um, the Highway Authority are, are content with the um, access in terms of safety um, sight lines and so on. Um, they're also content that there wouldn't be a adverse effect on the um, highway network in terms of vehicular movements. As um, members uh, will know, there, there is an existing lawful use on the site of, of the commercial use that will, will demonstrate a, a, a certain level of vehicular movements now. And it's also relevant that planning inspectors accepted uh, 54 dwellings on, on part of the site. Um, so on that basis, um, that there's no grounds to resist the application in terms of um, highway safety or vehicular movements. Um, the scheme provides 105 uh, car parking spaces, 85 allocated and 20 <coughs> unallocated. Um, that is less than the um, guidance in the neighbourhood plan and, and West Sussex County Council standards. Um, but that is, it's also um, the case that um, on the appeal scheme, there were far fewer spaces than, than those standards and the planning inspector found that to be acceptable. So that, that's dealt with in some detail in the report. Um, and on the basis that there's no highway objection um, to the application, and, and the planning history of the site, um, we're content that the level of car parking um, is acceptable. Uh, drainage, dealt with in, in paragraph 1280 of the report, but essentially um, the this, this scheme in terms of the surface water relies on uh, permeable paving in, in, on the site um, and the car parking areas and under the roads at the rear and then a swale. Uh, to the rear of the site, so it's infiltration on this site, and foul drainage would connect to the existing public 
um, sewer um, that runs along the, the A22. Uh, infrastructure is dealt with in paragraph 12.85 of the report. Um, developers are only required to mitigate the impacts of their own development um, and there would be a, a section 106 agreement to provide infrastructure contributions um, to mitigate the impact of, of their development and they're set out in the report that services provided by the county council, uh, the district council, um, the NHS and Sussex police. Um, it's not lawful to ask developers to remedy existing deficiencies in, in infrastructure. It's only the impacts of their own developments. And, and linked to, to infrastructure contributions, there will also be a requirement for contributions in relation to the, the Ashurst Wood uh, to mitigate the, the impact there. So I think those are the main issues I wanted to, to highlight. Um, but overall, officers are content the scheme does comply with the development plan uh, and therefore subject to the conditions that are suggested in the report and uh, the legal agreement to secure those things set out in the report. Uh, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. King. A very comprehensive report. Then. Thank you for that. Um, members, uh, do we have any questions or, on, on this application? Councillor Whitaker doesn't come up on my screen. Is has now. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, are, are, are there any speakers, uh, Chairman? First of all, no, there's no speakers. Sorry, I just wanted to double check that. Um, yeah, I've just got one question. Um, the um, schedule of um, infrastructure payments very comprehensive, nearly a million pounds, nine hundred and eleven thousand. So that's that's very healthy across the board. Um, I didn't see one for the Ashdown Forest contribution. Um, did I did I miss that, or did, is that in there somewhere? I think, Mr. King. Yeah, it, it is in the committee report. The, the SAM and the SANG contributions are, are set out in the in the report, um, so it will be necessary to provide them to make the development acceptable. Um, but they are they are set out. And the paragraph number. Okay. Yeah, it's paragraph 12.111. So they're in the report. Is there an amount? Oh, the amount, yeah, for the uh, SAM 58,500 and the SANG 80,522. Thank you. Councillor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It wasn't cl clear why um, they're coming down from 54 to 50 units now, and the fact that the 54 units couldn't actually be built, only in part. I, I was a bit confused by that aspect of it. Are you doing questions and uh, and speaking to this or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, ask the question and we'll answer it. Yeah. Yeah, are, we, are we coming back for speaking as well on it? Oh, uh, yes, oh, yes, Ken. Uh, uh, well, uh, I'm just uh, asking uh, the question at the moment. I'll come back and speak on it later. Okay. Ms. King, I think um, the Ashes would uh, neighbor, <coughs> neighbor plan or oh, was, was uh, against so those a lot of objections, wasn't there? Yeah, on, I think. On this 54. Yeah, so the, the, the 54 unit scheme go back um, is just what the developer applied for back in 2019 now on part of the site so that, that's wheeled and house there and here is where the EDF energy building is at the moment so the developer applied at the time in 2019 to develop just the EDF energy um, site for all these flats that was refused by the by uh, the, this council, but was allowed on appeal. So, so that is there as an extent planning permission on on half of the site. I think the developer has has chosen to to come back now with a a different scheme for the whole of the site, um, much more led by houses rather than flats, uh, which is what the. Um, 
parish council were seeking and, and envisaging. Um, so that's the developer has now come back with a, a scheme on the whole of the site um, to be developed in this way. Would you like to come back on the uh, council well, page before I go to the council reads? So I'm not totally convinced by the, the scheme, but you know it's gone through a, a lot of discussion and seems to have an, a general agreement. Um, I'm a bit concerned the fact that this is not being uh, able to deliver on affordable homes. When you look at the style <coughs> of the site and the, the units, you would have thought that that would have been an affordable, a totally an affordable site. So uh, the fact that we can't get 30% is baffling. Um, and also that there's a lack of parking up to the standard I found difficult to compromise. Right. Uh, this is uh, an improvement on the on the previous um, 54 flats. This is a less flatted development with more houses, more of a contemporary design. It certainly uh, meets approval of the urban designer, although he did have some concerns about the gardens, rear gardens facing the A22. But, but overall, the, the planning officers. Um, agree on the whole this is a much better development. Uh, you mentioned about the viability with well, the actually EDF energy building is 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 bomb proof obviously because it's electricity station so the actual costs of, of actually taking that down has made the development less viable and as Mr King said and it's in the report uh, that's done by our independent assessors and that will be reassessed during the built-out form. Hopefully it answers your question. Maybe sneak a bit in the more parking rooms. Chairman. Right. So did you want to come back? Uh, um, Council Reeves. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I noticed that the habitat assessment was carried out in the depths of winter and only in 2017-18, so I don't know if there's been uh, one since then. Um, I welcome the fact that this is a brownfield development and it's a, a very, very ugly building at the moment, so that's all really good. It seems a shame that car clubs haven't been thought of because this would be perfect for car clubs if there's not enough parking and there's no way they could park on the street, it would have been nice to see that. And uh, like Councillor Bates, I'm distressed that there is no affordable housing. So my question there would be, has there been a recent housing needs survey? Because obviously this is a rural area, it would be great to get the right housing in the right place. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, before I come to Mr King, I must remind members we're looking what's in front of us in the report. We're not looking at car clubs or anything like, like that. It's purely what, what's in, in, front, in front of us and we're not looking, we can't change it or add things to it. We make a decision on what we're looking at. Uh, Mr King, would you like to? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the query about car club sustainable travel um, I'll, I'll badge it up like that um, there there would be a requirement as, as part of the application for a, a travel plan to be um, prepared um, for the application and, and essentially that is designed to um, try and encourage more sustainable uh, forms of transport um, get people out of their cars and, and so on and, and that would be included as, as part of the, the Section um, 106 legal agreement um, because those are now uh, are monitored by the County Council and that there's a fee for doing that, so it, so it needs to be in, in, the, in the legal agreement. In terms of the affordable housing, um, what we're looking at on this application and what's before committee is whether this scheme can deliver um, any... Um, affordable housing, which, uh, as I've mentioned, the, the policy refers to 
it should be 30% on, on sites like this that are providing more than 11 dwellings, um, unless it can be demonstrated that the scheme isn't viable. Um, so that is what the, the applicants have done in, in this case, that they have provided that, that financial case that's, that's been <coughs> independently assessed um, and it, it's been accepted by our consultants that, that, that as things stand, this scheme you know, couldn't deliver any affordable housing, so um, it, it simply wouldn't be built and um, um, be brought forward if, the, if there was any um, requirement for affordable housing at the moment. Uh, in terms of the, the ecology, um, that, that has been assessed in quite a bit of detail by um, the uh, ecological consultants, and they did go back and forth with, with the applicants, and, and they were ultimately satisfied with, with what had been um, put forward. Um, and in, in terms of what's on the site, that there isn't a great deal of uh, um, anything of, of ecological interest at all. And I think as we saw from the um, overlay at the moment, you've got the ancient woodland right up to the um, existing car parking and, and there's a the 15 metre buffer is actually in what is existing car parking. So what's proposed in respect of the, the woodland is, is betterment really because you've now got a 15 metre buffer um, completely landscaped and, and free from, from all development and a um, proposal for, for a woodland uh, management plan um, in, the, in, in the blue land, which is the, the woodland to the rear. So I think we're, we're content and the ecologist was content that, that there were no reasons to resist the application based on um, ecology. I think we're trying to press the buttons, but uh, oh, you indicated you wish the. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's my fault. Sorry. Um, you've just answered my question. I was going to ask if the buffer zone was being reinstated by what is in the bottom right. I, can't, I don't know what the orientation is, but the, the, the bottom yeah. right corner. So you've answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. I know Councillor Whitaker wanted to come back. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, just to comment overall, really, that the first one was a question, if, if I may. Um, overall, yeah, um, a few years ago, the original application prior it going to appeal uh, came before this committee uh, and the flatted scheme. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, the parish council were not supportive. They are uh, very supportive of this one. And we've already heard from Councillor Belsey, uh, who is, is the ward councillor. Um, it's a much improved scheme. Um, it is a brownfield site, um, the, the very good financial contributions. Um, the uh, design, uh, I, note, I note that the urban designer objected to it, ironically, um, in, in his report, um, but I, I presume it's gone through a design review panel uh, process, but the design to me looks like it conforms to the Mid-Sussex design guide, so I, 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 I'm content with that. Um, uh, and, and I think, uh, in overall terms, uh, it, it makes a good contribution um, to you know, the, the housing number. So I, I would be supportive um, of this application, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, I see no other members wishing... Councillor Eads. Thank you, Chairman. So, One more question. Are there any electric vehicle charging points, or did I miss that? I think... Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the houses um, would all have um, EV charging points because um, that will be, be coming through as, as part of the, um, the building regulations. Um, if members wanted a, a further condition related to um, charging points for the um, car parking spaces uh, to the front of the of the the, the flats um, that could be added um, as i say for the houses it's dealt with under building regs okay do we need to add that condition no. do, do members wish to add that condition to car parking yes yes, yes. yes agree can we add that condition 
So, su subject. To, so, I see no other members wishing to speak. Um, I think we uh, go to the vote. Subject to recommendations on page ten. Recommendations A and B. And subject to that condition we've just agreed on, can members vote with the green button or on your keypads there, whichever button you want. Thank you. I think it's all nine voted. Eight voted in favour, one voted against. The application is approved. Thank you very much. So move to item six on the agenda, DM stroke 22 stroke 1774, Havelock Farm, Whitehurst Place, Arden Light. And uh, I'll ask Mr. Stuart Malcolm to introduce the report. Chairman, I'll just first of all, if I may, draw members' attention to the update sheet. Um, you'll have noted there's a, there's a couple of updates relevant to this application. Um, firstly, we've got um, some correspondence that you'll have all seen, hopefully sent directly from <coughs> Councillor Gary Marsh to yourselves uh, yesterday, I think it was, uh, objecting to the scheme, just setting out his concerns. Um, regarding the location of the proposed development, uh, the visual impact on the area and B, citing there's better locations available and the harmful effects on the listed gardens. And he was writing in his capacity as local ward member. Uh, we've had additional representations from slightly further afield, has to be said, uh, from the National Botanical Garden of Georgia. Just for clarification, that's Georgia the country, not the American state. Um, and that's also supported by the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, so both of these are, are bodies that understand work with Q uh, as part of their research and development, and that they've set out their reasons there in the update sheet about why they support the scheme. And then there are some slight amendments to the conditions that I won't read out verbatim here, that hopefully it's clear enough. Just some, just some modest wording changes to the pre-development conditions relating to work above ground level now. Uh, as well as some minor changes to conditions uh, 6, 7 and 8. So moving on to the details of the development. Um, so the application site is known as Havelock Farm and it's part of the wider Wakehurst estate that's located to the north of the Village of Ardingly to the north of the, the, sh the showground that you'll see um, on the, the left of the screen, just so you get your orientation. There is a little north marker down in the bottom right, so north is to the right as you look at this particular plan. Um, I think the other plans I've got in a moment, north will be pointing up, as you'll be more used to. So the site itself is, uh, like I said, sort of centrally located within the Wakehurst estate, and the, the application site is demarcated by the red line on the plan in front of you, uh, it's just here. Uh, measures just under 1.7 hectares in area. Uh, it's probably worth noting the whole of the Wakehurst estate, that is the land marked as blue, um, measures around 40 hectares. So in this location, the site <coughs> is within the defined countryside and it also falls within the high wheeled A and B. Uh, for any new members, you'll, you'll find we'd come and just leave commonly call that just the AOMB. Uh, there's probably a few acronyms like that in the report. In terms of the other defined constraints, the, uh, there's a public right of way that's referenced in the report. I've got a plan showing that in a bit more detail in a moment. That runs along the northern uh, part of the site. And the location of a number of heritage assets is uh, a key consideration of the main constraints. And again, I've got a plan to um, show them more clearly in a moment. So the site itself, uh, again, just 
mention it a moment ago, but just to orientate yourselves, North is up now, hopefully. Um, so the site was purchased by Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in 2012, at which point it did cease operations as a, as a working farm. Uh, I noted from the name that historically it's, um, it was a working farm. Uh, but a number of the old agricultural buildings remain on site towards the, the southern half of the site. Um, central part of the site um, has these sort of old corrugated type agricultural buildings and then in the southeastern part there's more permanent brick built structures uh, that, that members who could attend the, the visit on Tuesday will have noted. So the current use supports the maintenance and logistics of the wider Wakehurst estate, um, largely used for storage, various goods and materials, as well as support for vehicles, uh, things like tractors and trailers that are associated with the, with the maintenance of the, the wider estate. I think this plan is particularly useful um, to highlight the proximity of the neighbouring properties. Uh, that fall within private ownership as opposed to falling within the, the ownership of, of Wakehurst. So it's important to note that. And here we have Wakehurst Farmhouse, which is located, this is the nearest neighbour, it's located immediately to the east of the application site. And to the north we have the Pondfield Cottages. There's four properties up here, the Pondfield Cottages, uh, located just to the north. Moving on to the details of the proposal itself. Um, so the application before the committee today seeks consent to uh, redevelop the site and create a new conservation and research nursery. Um, the applicant has stated that the existing greenhouses located within the wall garden that is just, out, just on the edge of the shot here, further to the east, are no longer fit for purpose and that there is a, a need to provide far more energy efficient and controllable greenhouses to enhance their scientific and horticultural research that is a key part of, of their work. So the bespoke glass houses will be able to provide a range of environments required for the various research and horticultural projects being undertaken by Q. Um, members will have noted at para 10.3 of the report, there is a bit more detail from the applicant about uh, the overall need for the proposal and, and how it fits in with the sort of more strategic objectives of, of the applicant. But in terms of the detail, so the proposal involves the demolition of 2,300 square metres of the existing buildings, uh, the creation of a new gross internal floor space of just over 4,000 square metres, and that equates to an increase of some <coughs> 1,700 square metres of, of new floor space above what's there at the moment. So in the majority of that new floor space will be located within four glass houses uh, with that's one, two, three, four here, uh, as well as some other ancillary buildings, some polytunnel, so these are ancillary <laughs> buildings to the far south and the, and the north, um, some polytunnels just to the east and a shade structure uh, further to the south there. Not all the existing buildings are, however, to be demolished, but those deemed to have some heritage value. That's namely those brick-built, more permanent structures we saw in the southeast corner. They are being retained, as you'll see on this, this plan here. The proposal also includes uh, support spaces, such as areas for logistics and deliveries, potting, outdoor growing spaces, support offices, as well as some staff welfare facilities. I think the overall visualisation of the development is probably better, slightly better illustrated with this 3D image, which shows the, the site from a Western perspective. So I keep jumping around with perspective, so hopefully it's not too confusing. So this is looking from the West um, towards East, towards the site, uh, obviously from a, a, a raised position. And you'll see that the glass houses occupy a largely central location within the site, bookended by those modest ancillary buildings uh, I mentioned a moment ago. There's the polytunnels to the east and the, sh the shade structure uh, sitting behind the existing buildings to be retained in the southeast corner. And uh, Wakehurst Farmhouse, which I mentioned is the, the nearest residential property immediately to the east uh, in the background there. Do I have a question? Uh, 
I'm sorry, you're not allowed to I interact. I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to provide a bit more detail on the buildings now, with this image showing the largest of them, which is Glass House number one, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the twin polytunnels and the, the shade structure, just so you get your bearings of what's, what's on the screen in front of you. So, as I mentioned, Glass House one's um, the, the largest, which measures, largest of the four, I should say, uh, measures approximately 48 by 25 metres and has a ridge height of just over... Uh, seven metres. That's to the apex of the roof there, the eaves slightly lower. So the proposal, um, well it's proposed that this will, this glass house will provide temperate growing conditions that will be facilitated by a specialist glazing system that will control lighting, temperature and humidity among other things that are necessary to sort of modernise the, the, the nursery use that, that the applicant wishes to um, develop. Just got some floor plans to show you on, this is Glass House 1, so I've included these so that members can see the kind of supporting facilities that are to be delivered <coughs> alongside uh, the, the predominant growing areas. Um, most of this support is found within Glass House 1, but there is also some, some ancillary support within Glass House 3 as well. But but the, the, these plans show that there's defined areas um, for delivery, storage, potting, staff welfare, and offices, as well as and th this yellow area here. This is um, a somewhat modest area, but used for training, learning, and public engagement, which is seen as very much an ancillary part of the overall nursery use. Uh, so it's at that point that's worth worth noting that public access to the glouse is, is restricted to these modest educational and learning facilities within Glass House One. This is Glass House Two, uh, which is smaller, measures approximately 35 by 16 <coughs> metres, uh, slightly lower ridge height than Glass House One, um, coming up to uh, approximately five metres in height. This building will provide the Mediterranean and tropical growing conditions. Um, and this plan also shows the timber clad plant building that will be located to the south, uh, mentioned a moment ago, showed it on the site plan that bookends the, the, that sort of line of glass houses. So, glass houses three and four, uh, these will be used for science and quarantine purposes, respectively. Uh, the glass house three is the second largest of the four, which measures approximately 32 by 30 metres, with a ridge height not dissimilar to Glass House 2 of just over 5 metres in height. Glass House 4, which is down in the, the, the bottom left here, this is the smallest of the four and measures some 12 by 27 metres. Uh, members will note the timber clad water harvesting building is shown on the bottom right um, of this image too. So does, <coughs> excuse me. The design of buildings is probably better illustrated uh, than on those uh, technical elevation drawings with some 3D images which are, are taken from the applicant's design and access statement. Uh, design terms, members will have noted from the report that this application has been assessed by the design review panel, also known as the DRP, uh, both at pre-application stage and co they commented on the application once it had been submitted as a, as a, a live planning application as well. Uh, so no objections have been made by them as they conclude overall that it is a good scheme. <coughs> Neither of any objections has been made by the urban designer who has recommended some detailed design issues be secured by condition with these set out in Appendix A to the report. There's a, there are a number of landscape related conditions too that members will have noted also set out within a, Appendix A, uh, largely as recommended by the specialist consultees that have uh, commented on the, the proposals. And at that point I'll show you some landscape visuals. So these, these images are provided by the applicant, uh, taken from the visual impact study and show basically a, a, a before and after view from Paddock Hurst Lane over to the, some distance to the, to the west. Hopefully, I'm not sure how well it's come out on the, the size of the image, but hopefully it's clear enough, but it does show this is the before development, so as existing. Uh, and this is the uh, doctored image to show the, the, the same view with the proposal shown there too. But I think what it does 
um, shows that the development is quite well contained to the existing site when viewed from a distance, uh, like it is here from, from, from Paddock Coast. So, but it is obviously acknowledged that the application site is quite prominent within, within the AONB, uh, particularly bear in mind the location adjacent to a public footpath. But it's really important to note that the, no objections have been raised on landscape grounds by either the high wheeled AOMB unit or the council's landscape consultant. So the detailed landscape and design conditions just referenced a moment ago set out in Appendix A will ensure that the impact of the development, which is considered to be a good design anyway, as referenced by uh, the urban designer and the DRP, uh, is minimised in a sympathetic manner as far as possible. Uh, and this overall will have the effect of ensuring that the natural beauty of the AOMB is preserved. So as well as the design and landscape impacts, um, one of the other key issues is with this application is the impact on the nearby heritage assets. Uh, th these are summarised, uh, well the details of the heritage assets are summarised, uh, para 12.43 of the report and it does include uh, grade one and two star listed buildings to the southeast, as well as grade two listed park and garden to the south. So. Uh, this is the Grade 1 listed manor house, it's the Grade 2 star listed stables and the hatched area is the, the registered park and gardens. Um, as you can see it, it comes up to the border of, of the application site. Oh, this, this dotted line by the way, sorry, I sh should say, is the, this is the line of the footpath I mentioned a moment ago that I had on a, on a separate plan. Uh, there's also non-designated heritage assets, uh, these being defined as Wakehurst Farmhouse, which I've already mentioned is the, the immediately adjacent uh, neighbouring property, and the former farms courtyard buildings uh, located, and I touched on these already, these are the buildings that are to be retained in the southeast corner of the site. So the overall conclusion of the Conservation Officer and, and Historical England uh, set out clearly in the report uh, and show that a level of less than substantial harm will occur to both the designated and non-designated designated heritage assets. This level of less than st substantial harm must be given considerable importance and weight in the decision-making process. And para 12.68 set out in the report uh, makes clear what the balancing exercise that decision-makers need to go through uh, as part of the requirements of paragraphs 202 and 203 of the MPPF. So that's, that's in paragraph 12.68, you need to reference that. The planning officers consider that the specialist nature of the proposal for scientific and horticultural research that will be in the national interest and possibly beyond based on the, the additional letters of support we just had in, will ensure that the public benefits of the proposal outweigh the identified less than substantial harm. So just coming towards the end of the image I've got to show you, but th this one shows the, uh, some site sections that demonstrate how the buildings will be set into the slope to help reduce both uh, sort of twofold impact that really one to reduce the, the impact within the landscape and two to help reduce the, the impact on, on the neighbour, uh, particularly at Wakehurst Farmhouse, which is shown on the plans here. So for example, the plan indicates the ridge height of Glasshouse three which on, on this top section will be just over 0.5 metres higher than the finished floor level of Wakehurst Farmhouse uh, and that separation distance is some 65 metres in between at the nearest point in between the two. So as set out in the report officer, as officers are content that these separation distances from the new development uh, to any of the neighbouring properties whether that be the Wakehurst Farmhouse property or the Ponfield Cottages to the north uh, is sufficient and adequate to ensure that a significant harm cannot be demonstrated. So there are a number of conditions set out in Appendix A aimed at minimising the impact on neighbouring amenities such as the glare mitigation plan, the lighting plan, the <coughs> landscaping levels as well as construction <coughs> working hours. Members will be aware that the policy test for neighbour impact is whether significant harm will occur or not. Uh, and this, de this development officers acknowledge will certainly change the appearance of the site from the neighbour's perspective, but this in, in itself does not constitute significant harm. Just got one final image before the photos to show you. Uh, 
this is this is a, a, again a sort of a sketch view, three D image from the applicant's submissions that just helps demonstrate how the well helps visualise really how the uh, scheme will be set into sunk into the, the the natural slope of the land. So this is a view from the the northeast corner of the site from the the public right of way looking uh, southwest into the site. Uh, you just to get bearings, this is the entrance into Wakehurst Farmhouse, just the left hand side here. And it's on that note that I will transition to some photos because this photo is taken from a, a, a very similar, or so these photos, I should say, are taken from a very similar position to where that image was previously um, imagined from. Uh, and this is looking west down the existing public right of way. So, get bearings, this is the right of way. This is the existing access into the site, uh, and this is where the um, access road branches off into Wakehurst Farmhouse. And just at the end of this fence line, you can see it just about here, round to the right, this is where the Pondfield Cottages properties are accessed. Uh, photo two is a photo from further down the public right away, just to get your bearings. The previous photo was taken from uh, approximately this, this location here. Uh, so this is further down the, the public footpath looking back up towards the site. Um, the main part of the site is in the foreground here. Uh, Wakehurst Farmhouse located slightly higher up in, in, in the background there. And my final images, uh, one's taken from the design and access statement, and we can get a, a few more on the images uh, that way. We've got some aerial views uh, of the, the site some views of the neighbouring properties, Wakehurst Farmhouse, um, which is taken from close to the entrance to the driveway. A view looking from the site towards the, the Pondfield cottages, the four properties there, uh, and some further images of some of the buildings within the site. And the final slide uh, just shows some images that, that gives members more an idea of some of the buildings within the site at present for those who are unable to attend the visit on Tuesday. So these top three images show uh, the buildings that are present within the site at the moment, or it gives an idea of, of the kind of state they're in, at least. Uh, and the, the bottom three images show some of the images, basically showing that how the, there are wider views that are acknowledged across, across the valley. So this is looking uh, west across the valley there, and, and a similar view from a slightly different location here. So in conclusion, uh, planning officers consider this a good quality scheme that meets the policy requirements of the development plan and the MPPF. Overall, they're not considered to be any sustainable grounds to reject the proposal and the application is therefore recommended for approval. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Malcolm. Uh, we do have a, a few speakers on this, uh, some against and some for. Uh, the first speaker speaking against is uh, Mr James Holt. Thank you. If you'd like to take the seat over there, and I'll just explain the timing system. Um, this machine is set up for two minutes. However, you are allowed three minutes to speak. The first uh, minute will be timed by the legal officer. When the red light comes on, you will have two minutes. When the amber light comes on, you will have 30 seconds. And when the red light comes on, um, I will ask you to round up to your nearest sentence. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this statement is made on behalf of Carol Williams, the registered owner and occupier of Wakehurst Farmhouse, an owner of one Pomfield Cottages, uh, both residential properties neighbouring the proposed development site. The scale, mass and bulk of the proposed development is wholly inappropriate. The proposed floor area of 4,035 square metres is approximately 75% increase on the existing farm buildings. This will have some significant harm on the site within the area of outstanding natural beauty and the non-designated heritage assets of Havelock Farm and Wakehurst Farmhouse. The height of the proposed glass houses is detrimental to the landscape within the AOMB. Despite requests to install target height boards to demonstrate the height of the buildings, these requests have been declined. There is significant concern relating to the impact of the sun's glare of the proposed glass structures and the impact this will have on the neighbouring residential properties. 
Photos were submitted during the consultation phase, showing the path of the late afternoon sun and evening across the valley and the Havelock Farm site. The proposed development could be located on other parts of the Wakehurst estate, which would have less impact on the AOMB, neighbouring residential properties and these non-designated heritage assets. There has been little or no consideration to an alternative position for this development. Equally, there has been little collaboration with residential stakeholders on the estate uh, in developing the proposals for this scheme. The access of the proposed site is inappropriate. The transport statement refers to an existing four and a half metre wide road. The truth is the road narrows and at the driveway with Wake Wakehurst farmhouse, there is a blind bend which narrows to 3.7 metres. The section of proposed access comprises a public right of way. This poses a risk to both members of the public and the residents. To protect road users and residents, alternative provisions for access to the site should be considered. It is considered the development will have a significant adverse effect on the neighbouring residential amenity in terms of noise and privacy. Whilst conditions on noise levels are welcomed, we are aware that noise assessment reports supporting the application, including monitoring from areas on the Wakehurst estate, remote, remote from the residential properties, and including monitoring points closer to Selsfield Road. The reduction in noise levels should be based on noise levels taken at the, re the neighbouring residential properties. There is concern that the development will increase the existing problem with wind driving across the valley, which create dust clouds along the access way. The concern is the new buildings will funnel wind through the corridors, exacerbating the problem. Heavy construction vehicles during the construction phase will, will exacerbate this. Um, there is genuine concern on the impact of the privacy, particularly the gardens of Wakehurst Farm Warehouse, which run along the boundary of the application, application uh, site. Mr Holt, can I ask you to round up your nearest last sentence? That's please. fine. In summary, I'm against the proposal due to the adverse impact the development will have in terms of the, the, the items listed above. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Penny Ball speaking against the application. You're happy how the timing system works, are you? Uh, I think so. Yes? Yeah, I'll try to speak it on. Um, so if you'd like to oh, just come on now. Have you turned it on? Oh, no. Can I just want to introduce myself before I get into my few minutes, if I may. Penny Ball, one of the um, owners of Pumpkin Cottages. So I am impacted. I'm on the north boundary there. Uh, I would just ask you to go into your... your Fundamentally, uh, whilst having a seriously detrimental effect on the AONB and the SSSI, has completely ignored the adjacent residential properties at Pomfield Cottages. We have met with ward councillors to outline our concerns and gain their support, which I know has been now conveyed to the committee um, through Gary Marsh and others. The application process has been flawed throughout the in inaccurate boundaries and application information that has not been corrected to take account of this. Indeed, we received Certificate B, um, interest in ownership, the day after comments on the application were closed. This certificate was not sent by the applicant and was incorrectly addressed. The design and access statement remains unamended, ignoring correct boundaries and refers to analysis of other alternative sites, but no analysis has been demonstrated for these sites, which I believe undoubtedly would have little or no effect on the AONB and local residents and users of the public right away compared to the application site. As owners and residents, we've been ignored. Um, our properties are within the AONB and that's why we love to live there. We've been provided with derisory information via the applicant, not actually forming part of the application, left out, and labelled as diagrammatic, which is unverified and at an illegible scale. At the very least, at the planning process, we would have expected so, to see the impact of the property, and that's why I stopped, asked, wanted to ask the question earlier on about the 3D views and why the scale and the impact of that was not shown even to you guys. Um, there's been no verified views from our property, and when we, were, we asked for that, um, we were, again, ignored. That there was no evidence of the bulk and massing effect, um, and we presume that this is simply because it might actually demonstrate a negative impact. 
The application has no analysis on the potential sun glare from the proposed glazing, glazing on the properties, suggested properties, um, that will rely on artificial light, lights that will be on uh, all through the night. Um, how light spill will be, and will be countered and how the darkness, is, darkness in one amenity of the valley um, will be ruined and create a negative effect. The scheme will be detrimental on views across the valley. And it will impact all users, not just the people that live there. This is not a NIMBY. This is also about people other than us that use that valley and has been designated as an AONB. We've submitted our objections um, in detail, both here for us and across the valley. Whilst the proposed use is, is laudable, we all agree that Q potentially is doing good work. This does not mean that this site is the most appropriate, nor that function should trump all environmental and residents' concerns. There are other sites on the estate with significantly less impact, arguments which were confirmed by the now King Charles III and David Attenborough when planning was agreed for the initial Millennium Seed Bank. We can't disconnect this from 1996 development of the Millennium Seed Bank. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to round up to your nearest sentence, Of course. Please. 400 acres of beautiful countryside protected by the OANB. Where does the agreement to special circumstances stop? And what comes next as a request from Q? Please consider refusing the request for this proposed development, since once the decision has been made, there's no going back. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, speaking against the application is Mr. Glenn Adams. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll ask again, are you happy with the timing system? Okay, have three minutes. Ready? Yep, carry on, please. Thanks. I speak against the proposed development of an industrial scale building in an area of outstanding natural beauty and also in an area of historical significance. The setting is unique. Uh, area councillors Gary Marsh and Jenny Edwards have visited the site and have been shocked and dismayed at the intrusion on the landscape and the impact of such a large structure. I share their view. I've lived at Wakehurst Place for over 30 years and have seen numerous developments around me, including the Millennium Seed Bank, also on Havelock Farm, stable restaurant, entrance building, shop, cafe, large car park, also the introduction of wedding parties, numerous festival activities throughout the year. I've embraced all of these. I'm by no means a NIMBY. But this time a line has been crossed and the destruction of the entire landscape and its impact on the surrounding area is a step too far. The imposition of a vast glass building stretching across the entire top of the valley, along with an office building, is unforgivable. This is frankly incredible, given that to the north of the sea bank, there is about 20 acres for the greenhouses to be built without impact. I believe this was the original plan some years ago. This area is closer to the sea bank and would benefit from shared main services, easier construction access, and what would not be visible for the ANOB. The symmetry of function, services and access without the impact of the, of the proposed location are beneficial to all. When the sea bank was completed, a commitment was made by Mid-Sussex Planning to respect the achievement of a building which sat in the landscape with it, without intrusion or visibility from the area of outstanding natural beauty and alerted sub subsequent planners to the potential impact of expansion into the valley sound advice and judgment. The greenhouses in front of the scene bank and on top of the valley landscape completely negates that legacy. The seed bank project was under the stewardship of King Charles III and Sir David Attenborough. You cannot help but wonder how, how after such careful consideration for the landscape it is lost to a wall of glass. I find it impossible to comprehend the first planning committee of our newly elected council would permit a major development to be built in an area of outstanding natural beauty and lose a unique landscape and impact a historical setting forever. There are viable, non-destructive alternatives that could, should be explored that would resolve all vested interests of Kew, 
Wakehurst residents, and more importantly, our landscape and countryside heritage. I appeal to the committee to use this opportunity to hold permission and fully explore the many alternatives. And I must ask, would a full-scale commercial nursery, complete with office block, be permitted in the area of outstanding natural beauty, or even be considered anywhere if not presented by Q? Certainly. The Havelock Farm major development is basically the right project in completely the wrong place, and alternatives are available. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker speaking for the application is Harriet Jenkins. Your light should come on on in a minute. Oops. That's it. Thank you. Uh, continue when ready. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Harriet Jenkins from Grimshaw Architects, speaking on behalf of the design team that were appointed by Royal Botanic Gardens Q in support of the application. Committed to a collaborative approach, the client and project team iteratively engaged with stakeholders through the pre-application design development. Their feedback has informed and positively influenced the design. The client and design team have made further efforts through the determination period to respond to new comments, including modifications to the access road and the wider planting scheme. We are amenable to all the conditions. In acknowledging the project's location within the high wheeled area of natural beauty and proximity to residential properties, the design sensitively responds to its context. The proposal utilizes the sloping topography of the site which presents an opportunity to reduce the visual mass of the glass houses when viewed from higher land. The massing is broken down further by creating meaningful separation between glass houses with planted in between spaces. Rich landscaping further integrates the site when viewed from the valley beyond, serving to screen and filter, softening views and prioritizing biodiversity through introducing a multi-layered planting strategy that celebrates native species and landscape character assets. Whilst vehicle tra vehicular traffic to the site is expected to be very low, with larger vehicles expected only once every fortnight, efforts have been made to reduce the impact of this route. A shingled colored surface, shingle colored surfacing is proposed to tonally integrate the road access to its setting, assisted by the soft landscaping strategy. The high wheel design guidance has been adhered to, utilising natural, locally sourced materials wherever possible, of soft tones, introducing cladding of the solid areas of building in vertically articulated timber that will weather to a natural pattern. The, the team are adopting a rigorously sustainable approach that maximises energy efficiency through envelope design, while capitalising on passive measures. This will be supplemented by energy efficient technologies and on site energy generation. Thank you. Well, you had a little time to go, but you finished, so thank you very much. Our well, next speaker is Ed Eiking. Yes. Oh, thank you. Please continue when ready. Okay, <clears throat> my name is Ed Eichen and I'm the director of Wakehurst. The conservation research nursery will be transformative for Kew's scientific research, the next chapter in our site's development following the Millennium Seed Bank's arrival over 20 years ago. If approved, the nursery will be Kew's first large scale built for purpose research growing facility, a suite of precisely controlled growing environments, opening new frontiers for Kew's scientists. <clears throat> Wakehurst already has notable expertise growing wild species from seed for research. The Millennium Seed Bank is home to the world's most significant conservation programme, a vault against species extinction and a global partnership in 95 countries. Its seed research, its seed science research is dormancy, germination, and the traits, that's the useful properties of plants. It holds 2.4 billion seeds, representing 40,000 species. The nursery can unlock the potential of these seeds. We know these 40,000 species hold food crops, medicines, fibres and fuels of the future. Through highly controlled research environments, we can evaluate their potential. 
Testing useful plants from street trees to wheat against climate change scenarios can indicate which species will thrive and which will fail in a changing environment. Q's work has been invaluable to the coffee industry, allowing Ethiopian growers to select more appropriate plantation sites and find new species of coffee capable of productivity in a changing climate. The seed bank holds many wild crop species. These wild crops have desirable properties from drought resistance to nutrient density and could be future domestic crops. A £2.5 million grant has recently accelerated our wild crop programme and the research nursery can become the centre for this work. One of our most critical activities will be a propagation programme to reduce global plant extinction. With our international partners, we'll develop propagation protocols for the world's most threatened species, a step-by-step -step guide to growing the plant from germination <coughs> to reintroduction. If we can propagate a species, we can stop it from becoming extinct. An ash breeding programme will support development of trees resistant to ash dieback the disease which has devastated Sussex woodlands. The Sea Bank holds the UK National Tree Seed Project, which has over 90% of the known genetic diversity in ash. Q scientists have identified genes which can confer resistance onto ash, and our programme will research this resistance. Q's Mining Medicinal Molecules programme identifies plant compounds with medicinal potential, including molecules from salvia that can have the potential to improve memory. This programme will undertake a step change in activity through the research nursery. The nursery can accelerate Q's work on fungi. Fungi underpin all life, providing nutrients to plants and sequestering most of the, of the global carbon stocks. By testing different environmental conditions, we can better understand fungal health and the conditions required to improve its abundance, diversity and function. Q has raised eight million pounds for the conservation of research nursery, including a successful Wolfson large grant. Donations are specific to this project and can't be used elsewhere. Eight million pounds represents the largest investment in Wakehurst for over a decade. An investment in the purpose of Wakehurst that will transform our botanic garden and bring globally significant science to Mid Sussex. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to members, uh, I think I must say that we all know the important work Kew Gardens does for the future of our environment and looking after plants and what we can get from them and growing seeds. Um, it's just one point that came up about why this uh, application can't be located in another part of Wakehurst Place. Well, that's something that we're not looking at. That is not the application that is before us. So, members, I just want to make sure that you realise that we are looking what is in front of us, not locating it somewhere else. So, I will open up to debate. Uh, do I have any questions? Please must be one. Well, uh, Councillor Bates. In terms of questions, Mr. Chairman, I was going to ask about the uh, location issue, which it is an issue. Um, I was a bit concerned about what I heard about maybe the pre application consultation was not wide enough. Um, it's all right having stakeholders, but there are other people involved, I'm sure. And one thing, technically, from being on the site and looking, I know it's sloped away, is the land actually going to be lowered significantly to try and reduce the impact of these buildings that are proposed. So I wasn't clear whether just that the slope of the land was going to go away, is it going to be lowered further? Uh, well, it, it is on the slope and, and it will have the effect as we've seen from the plans that uh, Mr Malcolm's put up on the screen, but I will pass that over to you for comment on that question. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, quite briefly, the, 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 the land will be, will be lowered where it needs to be. It will be cut into the land. So you'll, you'll see from these sections that the, um, the slope naturally falls down from uh, east to west, uh, largely. And you'll see that the, the, the finished floor level it's sort of dug into the slope to help reduce that overall bulk, which, uh, like I said in the, the presentation, it's there's a sort of twofold reason for that, really, both in terms of reducing the impact on the wider landscape as well as from the neighbouring perspective. It's worth noting that the hard landscaping details condition sets out the requirements for those levels to be agreed through officers as part of any consent that's given. Thanks, Jim. I think it might be helpful if we could go back to the landscape visual screenshot and the sketch view from the PRO looking into the site. 
And I think you can see see from there that it's the bottom right hand one is the is the, see the screening that's the after. Yeah. And the one before that was the landscape or or the sketch view. I think that gives a good idea of the landscaping round in glass houses. So Sorry? I'm just saying. Uh, sorry, I'm not let. I, I can't have you interacting with the committee while it is debating this application. Uh, Councillor Avery. There was one point made by one of, the, uh, one of the speakers about the effect at night that the, the greenhouses would be lit at night. Is, is that a fact? Is that going to happen? Because obviously that would have an effect on the night sky and, and such as that. So uh, is, that, is, that a, is that a proposal? Is that part of the thing? Or will it just be yeah, accepting natural light during daylight hours? Thanks, Chairman. There's a, there's a detailed lighting condition set out in Appendix A. And unusually, there's three reasons given for that condition, uh, one being to ensure that the impact on neighbouring amenity is minimal. Two, to ensure that the impact on local biodiversity is minimal. And three, to ensure that the impact on the dark skies of the area and B is also minimal. So strangely, we, the <coughs> environmental protection officer, when they looked at the submitted lighting assessment, said it was acceptable from a residential amenity perspective but we also need additional details to cover the other two points, hence why there's a condition in seeking more details to address those three key issues. So I can't rule it out that there'll be lighting at night, but what I can confirm is that it will be robustly considered what is submitted uh, by experts that, that can comment accordingly. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Russo, did one come? Councillor Avery's come. Okay. Um, yeah, as uh, actually has been alluded to, the uh, the public benefits on this application, as alluded to in the report, outweigh the harm. And also, as regards to the, the um, Wakehurst Farmhouse there, uh, the conservation officers uh, decreed less than substantial harm. So, um, do I have any other members that wish to speak? I'm, I'm sorry, madam. You're... I can't hear you. I, I can't ha I, I can't see things going actually. Sorry, I can't have you interacting while we're making a decision. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Whitaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. I know it's extremely frustrating uh, and, and an emotional time, so I, I, I fully understand um, the points that all of the speakers have made, both against and for. Um, but just looking in the cold light of day on the on the logistics of it, it's a steeply sloping site. The buildings at a low level, and I think they they complement the slope. And, and and there isn't an alternative location effectively. But if there was, I don't think it would be as accommodating as this. Last time I looked, glass is transparent and not not opaque. Uh, I understand the points about the sunshine. Um, the high wheeled unit, who are usually a very very critical unit, are supportive. The design review panel are supportive. The neighbourhood plan of Ardingly supports, in principle, um, a, a, a additional um, investment at Wakehurst. We know it's a world-leading garden uh, facility um, backed by a world-leading institution. The landscape screening, the current screening, I think, is very good from the site visit we did. It's, it's very, very extensive. And we, we know uh, from the site visit that there will be extra significant extra west screening that, that will be going in. Um, I think the CGIs were very useful. They always are a very useful tool, and I think they particularly, in, in this particular case, this will improve what is there, and it will bring significant investment and prestige to, to the district. So, I, in, to my opinion, the benefits far outweigh the negatives, even though I fully understand the frustrations of, of the local neighbours. So I am a supportive, Chairman. Thank you. 
Councillor Bates, you wanted to come back. Yeah, well, I was speaking now, Mr Chairman, I just wanted to make it clear that I am supportive of this project. But I do go along with the fact that we haven't really clarified that this is the right location. And I think we um, should give um, the public an opportunity to know what the other locations are, which one speaker mentioned a previous um, application or proposal, another site. So I think we should know that information and be reported on. I mean, the irony of it is it's not to do with exactly with this application, but when I lived in Sweden, I would see that view, the vista that we looked at the other day all the time. And the fact that I'm now going to see a building in front of it would not go down well. So I think it was a unique um, site. So I think we should be very um, understanding of what we're going to do with it. And that we haven't really discussed or looked at understanding of the other sites that are being suggested. And in fact, one was proposed many years ago. So I, I think we owe it to people to do that. Thank you, Councillor Bates. So as I alluded to earlier, we can only look and make a decision what is in front of us. I will pass that over to Mr Malcolm, obviously. You know, perhaps you can elaborate on that. I don't think I could say any more about it, really. I think you've kind of done my job for me, Chairman, thanks. But you're quite right. The application before members is for the development of this application site in the form put forward by the developer, uh, by the applicant. Um, based on, on all the elevations, plans, etc., submitted. Uh, there is a, a short paragraph on this particular issue in the report, uh, which is paragraph 12.40, um, but it, it, basically there is, a, there is a section in the design and access statement submitted by the applicant that, that does a, a brief critique of, of three other sites within the Wakehurst estate. But that, it, those sites are not what's before members today when it comes to the decision making. It needs to be based on what the proposal is now and, and for the reasons given. Officers consider that the, the proposal as submitted in this location is acceptable. Uh, and I think it's just, a, it comes back to the old cliche, of it, it's what's before members. So, thanks, Chairman. Yep, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so, uh, just to reiterate to, to, to the speakers that we've had. Uh, yeah, we do realise your concerns, but we have to look at planning policies and it's quasi-legal, so it's not a wish list, it's, it's what we have to go by certain criteria, otherwise we would seem deemed to be unreasonable in, a, in our decision making. Um, I see no other speakers, so I will go to the recommendations on page 114. Uh, it's recommended that planning permission is approved subject to the condition listed in uh, Appendix A. Uh, so can you please vote now, please? The voting is seven votes in favour, one vote against and one vote abstaining. The application is approved. Thank you very much. So uh, we go to, um, excuse me, item seven on the agenda, questions pursuant to council Procedure Rule 10.2, do you notice of which has been given? I have none. And I close this meeting at 15.27. Please remain seated while, the, while we finish.